Thank you. It's uh, great to be here speaking about Murray Rothbard because uh, Murray Rothbard was the person who influenced my thinking on uh, political and economic questions more than anybody else ever since I first read uh, Man, Economy, and State 50 years ago. And I'm also delighted to be here at the Mises Institute because uh, the Mises Institute and especially its founder, Lou Rockwell, have supported my work over many years. Uh, I want to uh, talk today about Murray Rothbard and revisionism. And we want to ask the question, why was Rothbard interested in revisionism? Uh, as you know, Rothbard as a libertarian would, it was of course very strongly opposed to war because in wars there are massive vi uh, uh, aggression, violation of people's rights, and also uh, war is a great promoter of the power of the state. You remember in Tom DiLorenzo talk yesterday, he mentioned Randolph Bourne's famous essay, War is the Health of the State. And we know from Robert Higgs' great work, Crisis and Leviathan, and other works of his on how the state power is grown through war. So where does revisionism come in? Well, in the wars that the U.S. has been involved in, there's, and sometimes this is true for other countries as well, there's been an attempt to show that each war is not just a struggle between contending states for power, but that the wars of the U.S. are somehow moral crusades that we're facing an evil power bent on world conquests that we have to oppose. So Rothbard, as someone, an opponent of war, was naturally concerned to uh, counter that. But one thing in his attempts to counter this I think is crucial, that he wasn't taking the point of view, well, we can just deduce that all such accounts are false, that it's always false that one side or the U.S. is, uh, it's always false to say that the U.S. is engaged in a moral crusade. What if it turned out to be true in particular cases? This is not something we could just deduce a priori was false. And this is where, it, what he thought was that it was necessary for each war to do a detailed study of the historical evidence in each case. We, we would have to look at the facts. We couldn't just say, well, the state is uh, always going to propagandize, so we can just dismiss what they say. We have to look at the evidence. And this is where the revisionist movement came in. Uh, when we talk about revisionism, we want to know, well, what is it they were the revisionist historians were trying to revise? And the movement came in after World War I. They had in mind particularly to revise Article 231 of the Treaty of Versailles, which ended uh, the first, uh, first World War. And this said that all the blame for the responsibility for the World War I rested entirely with Germany and her allies. So the revisionists were those who favored revising that. And, uh, at the time it, when World War I was going on, there was a, a picture that the Germans, particularly under the leadership of Kaiser Wilhelm II, were <clears throat> bent on the conquest of Europe and perhaps the world as well, and there was need to, for the United States to counter them. There were all sorts of movies on the uh, attacking the Kaiser and the Germans generally. And in fact, in the treaty, I think it's Article 235, there were calls to, uh, there was a call to try the Kaiser for war crimes. Uh, this wasn't successful. In fact, the Ka Kaiser Wilhelm lasted a very long time. He didn't die till 1941. He was in exile in Holland. But in the 1920 and 1921, there were three articles published in American Historical Review by 
uh, Sidney Bradshaw Fay, who was a professor at Harvard, that challenged the Versailles war guilt thesis. And Fay pointed out in one of the articles that uh, there was a claim that in Ju July 1914, right after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand the previous month, there had been a Crown Council meeting at which the Kaiser, along with the various uh, people in the German Foreign Office and General Staff, had plotted war. And he was able to show that that account rested on a misleading uh, misleading uh, report by the American ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, Ambassador Morgenthau. So Faye's work attracted some attention. And then the leading publicist of the movement was another historian, Harry Elmer Barnes. And he was not only a historian and sociologist, but a public figure. And he, he, was, uh, he was a newspaper columnist. He was an associate of uh, H.L. Mencken and wrote very widely on journalism. I remember when I was in high school, I once asked Barnes, this was in the, we're having the 1964 election where it was Goldwater against Johnson. And I asked him what he thought of the election. He said, as my old friend Henry Mencken once said, I think I'll sit this one out. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you uh, one story about Barnes that Murray Rothbard told me. Uh, uh, Murray was uh, in charge of, a, at one time, editing a volume of essays in honor of Barnes. And uh, uh, it later went to some other, Arthur Goddard took over the editorship. He also was one who helped Goddard help Mises on human action. But in any event, uh, Barnes said that when uh, contributors would send in essays, if they had anything critical of Barnes, Barnes would insert comments in the person's essay. He would put in uh, things like, uh, Professor Barnes would respond to this point in such and such a way. And Murray said, uh, hey, he wrote his own fest shrift. <laughs> so uh, Barnes, became, uh, uh, Mur Murray Rothbard became friendly with Barnes. And uh, this, he accepted Barnes's views on the Origins of the War, World War I. What I want to go in the in the, my talk today is give Barn, uh, Rothbard's views on uh, origins of World War I, American entry into the war, and then World War II and American entry into that into World War II as well. Uh, uh, Rothbard didn't write all that much on war origins, but he did talk about it, so I know what his views were. Uh, he accepted the view that Barnes uh, promulgated in his 1926 book, Genesis of the World War, was revised two years later in 1928. And according to Barnes, the primary responsibility for the outbreak of the war rested not on Germany, but on France and Russia. And Barnes particularly pointed to the desire of the French president, Raymond Poincaré, to recover the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, which had been surrendered to Germany after the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71. And Poincaré, in conjunction with the Alexandrius Volsky, who was the uh, Russian ambassador to Paris, the Rus he had previously been Russian foreign minister, and the Russians were very anxious to gain control of the Straits of Constantinople, which were under the control, of, of course, of the Ottoman Empire. So according to Barnes, the, uh, uh, the, it was the, uh, uh, France and Russia had instigated the, the war in order to secure uh, Alsace-Lorraine for France and the control of the Straits for uh, for Russia. <laughs> I should say this thesis wasn't accepted by Sidney Fay in his book, uh, Origins of the World War, which also came out in 1928. He wasn't as strong a revisionist as Barnes, but uh, he, he 
said there was a more divided responsibility for the war. And in the 1930 edition of his book, he criticizes Barnes uh, on this point, but Barnes replied to him. So, but Rothbard was inclined to uh, accept what the Barnes's view of the war. Now, on on American entry into World War One, here uh, Rothbard largely followed the work, great work of uh, Charles Callan Tansel, "America Goes to War," which came out in 1938. Tansel was uh, probably the f one of the two foremost American diplomatic historians of the 20, uh, uh, two or three uh, foremost American diplomatic historians of the 20th century, along with uh, William L. Langer, whom Gary North mentioned yesterday, and Samuel Flagg Bemis. But in uh, what Tansel stressed particu particularly was that America under Woodrow Wilson adopted a very unneutral policy from the beginning in which uh, uh, British violations of American neutrality, such as the, uh, I guess someone doesn't approve of Tansel's <laughs> thesis. Uh, so the British uh, violations of American neutrality were largely ignored, but uh, uh, Wilson insisted a very strict uh, interpretation of German violations of American neutrality. And in fact, his unneutral policy led the Secretary of State, uh, William Jennings Bryan, to resign. Uh, Tansel's work was based, uh, as always with him, on exhaustive research into the archives. And it became uh, the uh, generally accepted view that America had pursued this unneutral policy. Uh, I should tell you one uh, story about Tansel, since I've given one about Barnes. Uh, uh, Tansel was a, uh, was a Texan. He was very strongly, uh, uh, had very strong views in favor of the South in the Civil War. And once by some odd uh, work of events, he was asked to give the annual Lincoln Day speech in <laughs> Washington, and he gave a very fierce denunciation of Lincoln. And I, uh, I think the controversy over his speech was so great that he almost lost his, his job. I think at that time he was teaching at, at, uh, at Fordham. He later went to Georgetown, but he almost lost his job. So. Uh, uh, that uh, Rothbard relied in his views on uh, American entry into war principally on Tansel, although he did emphasize more than Tansel did the influence of uh, the Morgan banking interests. Uh, Tansel thought Morgan banking interests were important, but he didn't place much stress on it as Rothbard did. Now, turning to World War II, we have a situation where uh, we really, there was a very evil regime in power in Germany, but one point Rothbard made, I remember there was a speech in San Francisco in 1979 where he was emphasized this, was uh, you can't uh, argue from saying that a totalitarian power is necessarily aggressive. You can't say the more the uh, totalitarian the government, the more aggressive it is. We could have counter instances of that. For example, Cambodia under uh, Pol Pot was extremely destructive and totalitarian, but it wasn't aggressive in foreign relations. So on World War II, Rothbard was thought that uh, Germany was not aiming at world, the world war that broke out in September 3rd, 1939, that uh, Hitler was trying to reach a settlement with Poland. He wanted a return of the free city of Danzig to Germany in a motor road across the Polish corridor. But the Poles, under the influence of, uh, the, especially under uh, Foreign Minister Josef Beck, refused to negotiate. So the court, uh, Rothbard here followed the work of A.J.P. Taylor, Origins of the Second World War, that came out in 1961, in saying that the 
World War II had largely come about by improvisation. It wasn't a deliberately planned event. And another book that very strongly influenced him was one by the uh, American economist, uh, Germany's Economic Preparations for War, uh, I think came out in 1959, which argued that Germany had not built up an extremely large armament contrary to the propaganda of Winston Churchill, but in fact, they were just, uh, aim they just had enough armaments for very quick campaigns, as in the ones against Poland. So uh, Rothbard did not accept the usual view, which is the prevailing view today, that Hitler was aim deliberately aiming at a world war. Then on American entry into the war, he again followed the views of another book by Charles Tansel, which is uh, Back Door to War, which came out in 1952. And what Tansel argued was that uh, Roosevelt wanted to enter the European war that began, as I say, in September 1939, but he realized that the American people wouldn't support such a move because America had uh, was favored uh, non-intervention in the European war following the bad experiences of World War I. So to get into the war, Roosevelt followed a deliberately provocative policy toward Japan, knowing that if he did that and was able to uh, get the Japanese to attack the U.S., then the uh, Axis powers would come in on Japan's side, and that's indeed what happened. So in conclusion, Rothbard felt that by examining the historical evidence on World War I and World War II, it was clear that the mythologies that had supported America participation in both wars were not correct and insubstantial. We, we found that there was a support for his libertarian view that uh, war is to be avoided at nearly all costs. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm.